able to finish up this section today and get a good start on the next section on adsorption. But before we move to that, let's just look here at liquid liquid extraction, this final example of counter current operation. And we were looking at part three in the class last time. I'll just quickly tell you about part one and two. Part one and two are just using the regular cross current setup. And in particular, I specify there a certain solvent usage, so it's a little grayed out over here, but we were using 50 kilograms of solvent in the first stage, 50 kilograms of solvent in the second stage. So a total solvent requirement of 100 kilograms per hour. And this is a great one for you to go try out at home, and there's the answers there. You can show you get 93% recovery using 100 kilograms of solvents and your concentration of that extract stream. So uh, let's just quickly visualize what we're doing here. We've got solvent coming in and we've got feed coming into the first unit. So there's my first cross current unit. And then I send this raffinate from the first step to subsequent processing with fresh solvent. So solvent one, solvent two. So this is 50. This is 50, so I'm using a total solvent of 100. And then I've got raffinate leaving R2, and I've got extract leaving at each stage. So what I can do is, and you can show quite easy, you can take this overall extract 1 and extract 2. What we'll do in practice, because we want to now recover our solute from that, is you'll go and combine these two streams up and get an overall extract stream. So a simple mass balance on this will get you the total flow of E1 plus E2. And then you, you know as well the concentrations of these. So uh, Y EA from sorry, Y E1 solute A and then Y E2 solute A. So you know the mass fractions. You know the individual mass fractions and you know the individual flows, so you can then go calculate that overall concentration in the stream. Okay, so that's 21%. So that's the great part. Now in the counter currents flow, we're going to have, we don't have one, I, we don't have two extract streams. We in fact just have one single extract stream leaving. So just go visualize that up here. In the counter current setup, I've got one solvent flow, and that moves across and I get one extract flow. Okay. So counter current has got two streams entering, two streams leaving overall. So it's a little bit simpler from that perspective. And what we're going to do in today's class is we're going to calculate that recovery and concentration of that extract stream. And we're going to contrast it to the cross current setup. And you'll see that for a very low solvent flow here, 28 kilograms per hour, we actually do <coughs> as good as the two cross current units. So we get by with far less solvents. Okay, so last class you had set up this diagram already. Uh, we had calculated where that endpoint is, that, that mixture, which is a fictitious mixture. Some people were asking afterwards, where is M? <coughs> Physically, M doesn't exist. M is simply a conceptual mixture which says take all these uh, where's this one that I have here that shows it with the boundary drawn? So if you just draw a boundary over your entire cross-current unit, now we don't know how many stages we have. We may have two, three, four, five, it doesn't matter. But M is simply the total sum of the material in that, in all those banks. So that mixture M is a fictitious point then. Each stage is in the future. Um, so M is that, that mixture point over there, and we know that it's going to be on the line between S and F. We also know that M is going to be on the line that connects E1 and R1, okay, just from our overall balance. So then we drew a line last time through E1, through M, and then the final raffinate leaving in the final stage, Rm. So that's, that locates E1 for us, because we specify Rm. And then last class, we ended off by just finding where that P point was. The operating point P is found by drawing a line through S, which we know, and going through Rn, which we've specified, and just project that line out. So we don't know how far to go yet, 
and we just draw that arbitrarily long, and then we know this line also passes through E1, which we found through F, and where that intersects, that's our operating point P. Okay, so sometimes that point P will be on the right-hand side of the triangle, sometimes it will be on the left, just depending on whether you've got solvents and carrier flipped around. So P is not guaranteed to always be up there on the right, and sometimes be on the left. Okay, and then you just begin your stepping approach. So last time people stepped down, other people, some people found five stages, some people found six. Is that, is that what most got? Five or six stages, okay? So um, let's uh, show the step for the first stage. We know where E1 is. Well, E1 is in equilibrium with R1. We just draw that, uh, that bank over there, E1, my first bank, I've got my feet coming in F. I have my extract leaving E1. Leaving over there, I've got R1. So R1 and E1 are in equilibrium with each other on that first bank. Okay, and here's my second bank. So R1 and E1 are in equilibrium. We can connect that point up with this blue tie line or interpolate it between the existing tie lines. This gives me R1. Now once I have R1, I know that on my next stage, the operating point there is E2. This is this red line that connects E2 and R1 and P. So from that mass balance last time, we showed that those points will lie on the same line. So I've got R1 now. I know where P is, so I project my line actually from P up through R1, and I find where E2 is. So that's going to, I don't know E2 until I've done that, so now I have E2. I mean, you got R1 by the to the time tie I get, sorry, R1. R1, sorry, going to the time from E1. E1 and R1 are on the tie line, so okay. that's drawn in blue over there. Okay. And then, so red lines are for the, through the operating point, blue lines are through are parallel to the tie lines or interpolated with the tie lines, I should say. So keep stepping through that and you get a, a fairly messy process um, that looks at the end like that, that shows all the, all the stages concentrations. So E1, E2, 3, 4, 5, some people got 5, some got 6, and these points will be shifted at various locations depending on how, how you've worked through that. Okay, so the, the main point is you stop when this in last interpolation, so let's follow this blue line here. So E6, I know where E6 is. I come across through the tie lines and it lands up just below Rn. So either you land up identically on Rn or at some lower concentration. Indicates that you've got enough stages now to achieve your goal. Yes? How did I get E2? Okay, so E2 is, we, we have from this, uh, let's go back here to this equations up here. For my operating point, E2 and R1 are on a line that's connected with P. Okay. So R1, E2 is equal to P. So R1 minus E2 equal to P. Another way to say that is R1 plus P is equal to E2. So I know that these three points are on the same line. So back, back out here, E2, so I've, so I know, I've got R1 now. R1 is there. I know that. Okay. I know where P is, so I can find E2 by just bringing the, this red line over from that operating point P through R1 and land at E2. So then you zigzag across the rest of the steps. That's my opinion. Are you able to, like as, as you add like an additional tray or stage or whatever, um, the, dif the difference between like your points get smaller? Like are you able to um, find out like how um, successful like of a tray is? Yeah, by, so. Like, finding like the area between the curves or Okay, so what we're going to do next, and, and the next question is to ask you to plot those concentrations in successive stages. 
uh, you can get a curve like that by reading off. So if you plot your um, percentage solute, this vertical axis I should label as percentage A or percentage solute. Um, so in my raffinate streams, they successively get lower and lower. And also my extracts, in fact, get lower and lower as I move from stage to stage to stage. Okay, so you can, you can see there's some sort of diminishing returns there. But you need that six stage to still achieve your goal. Remember, our goal is to get to two and a half percent in that graphing stream. So you just you may find you need a lot more stages to get tapers off there. Okay, so calculate then the recovery and calculate the extract concentration leaving the system. So you, you've landed up with this diagram. What is the recovery? So the extra concentration actually is much easier to calculate for the countercurrent setup. We simply read off the concentration in the last one. Okay, so it's uh, y six. Yeah, what's a uh, so in terms of solute? Well, it's 49, 48, 49 percent solute. So so uh, let's uh, y e one comma a is equal to c uh, 59 percent. So a very high concentration of solute in that extract stream. What's the recovery of the solute? What did we define recovery as last time? Is 
So one minus the raffinate concentration leaving in the last stage times the flow of raffinate in that last stage divided by what we fit in. So XF A times the flow rate. Okay, so one minus what's the feed concentration, I'm uh, sorry, what's its concentration leaving in that last stage? Okay, 0 0.025. And in fact, in this diagram, so I overshoot it a little bit. But uh, let's be, let's play conservative and, and use the achieved value of 0 0.025. And the flow of that stream and our flow was 112 kilograms. How do we get Rn, that flow? So Rn, in other words, I'm asking, what is the flow rate of this stream over here? So if we're feeding at 112 kilograms per hour, What is that flow leaving at the exit point over there? Just do a mass balance. Can we assume that you're the mass that changes the Can we assume that R6 is 112? Okay, so coming in, our solvent is 28 kilograms per hour. Is E1 going to be greater than that, smaller than that 28? It's going to be greater, we said that last time. And then R6 has to be smaller. That's what we this all to balance. So how, how can we find that flow R6 or Rn in this case? This is not tricky. This is just something you get quickly, right? Any suggestions? Just a component balance on the volumes. The component balance on the solute. So you know this flow, you know this solute concentration, you know this flow. Okay. So we have two flows we got to know. Two component balances, two equations. Can you do what we did before with the tie line between? Yeah, so use the lever rule. We know where E1 is. We can measure this distance E1 to M to Rn. We know the mass of M, so we can then use the lever rule to calculate either the flow or mass of Rn, and then do a second go at that to calculate the mass of E1. Okay, so lever rule is going to do that for you. Um, so you can then get that Rn is 88 kilograms. So I'll leave you to prove that to yourself. And then the recovery is 92%. So, 92%, actually the recovery is a little higher than that because remember we, we use the more conservative value for XRN of 2.5%. So, either way, recovery is 92%, that extract concentration is 49%, and What's really interesting here is that we get comparable recovery. That's remember that's our key number that gives us the performance for the system. Comparable recovery, much much lower solvent use. So 30, uh, 28 kilograms of solvent use, 100 kilograms of solvent use required here. And we said last time we really want to minimize that solvent use as much as possible. Here's a, a few reasons why I've put up in the slides. There's a, a one additional slide on the revised version on the website. Um, so these are some notes from a short course on solvent extraction that I got some permission to use. And the key issue about solvents are they're, they're toxic in most cases. They're expensive. 
and they're a hazard to work with. We have to have very special piping for them. Okay, solvents, the last thing you want to do is, is set them on fire. And unfortunately, solvents traveling through a pipe at high speeds create static electricity through the pipe, and that can create an ignition source. Okay, so solvents are really tough to work with, and if we can minimize the amount that we need, we definitely want to do that. So here's some guidance given for solvent extraction systems. Pick a solvent that has a high flash point. Uh, pick a solvent uh, or pick a system that will avoid static electricity generation. In other words, don't use plastic piping. Okay, use metal piping that will conduct that electricity away and hurt the one. Um, feed your solvents from the bottom of the tank and not in the side to avoid splashing. So avoid any areas for air pockets to trap and create an oxygen source. Avoid generating mists and all your electrical circuits around the solvents need to be explosion proof. That more than quadruples the cost of that electric, those electrical circuits. Um, and then a full analysis of the hazard and fire assessment needs to be done. So wherever it's possible, we want to minimize solvent usage. And so cross current then is not effective. Counter current is far more effective at achieving the same recovery with much, much less quantity. And of course, that saves us money, so we don't have to buy as much solvent. Okay, any questions on solvent extraction before we move on to the next section? Yeah, there's a slide of parallel. Yeah, if you're interested in this topic, you can go work through that. It's a mental exercise that can, um, I think you guys are all so tired and non reactive today. The last thing I want to put you through is to explode your mind on that slide. It just takes a little bit of thinking and mental juggling, which is, and it's not too important either. The slide fights. So. Okay, anything else?